Hey guys, I'm Dustin with Hard Cruise Racing and the owner of Cruise and Customs. We're a custom automotive shop. And today I want to talk about the Conso uh, P1206 RB1. But more importantly, I also want to go into what you need as an upholstery shop or if you want to do upholstery or canvas work as far as like an industrial machine at all. I'll compare the 1206 to some of the older models like the 206 or uh, even the Singer 111, 155s. Um, these are older machines. The 1206 was just released a few years ago and it, and it really is an upgrade. So I kind of want to talk about what the differences are because... I know as a, for our shop at least when I was looking at upgrading a machine and getting a newer machine the 1206 kind of made me nervous when I was going to buy it okay the uh, the price was a little bit lower which is weird for something that just came out and then we were using a uh, the Singer 111s and I've used the 206 in, in the past but you know we've used like Juki's but you know when we're looking for a new machine to really be the powerhouse of our shop I landed on the 1206, but there wasn't a lot of information out there about it or the differences, so I kind of want to go into that, okay? So I've used this 1206 almost exclusively for the last four years now, four or five years, I believe. Uh, in this, I mean, like I said, we're going to this from a, from a Singer 111, 155, which is, as a lot of you guys know, is a powerhouse machine, okay? That is the, the machine, the 155, was developed during the war um, as a sewing machine to just keep on going okay didn't matter if they were sewing canvases or leathers or whatever it may be um it, it was just meant to keep going okay and it was used heavily in the in in the war effort and then once the war effort ended a lot of the uh automotive or marine shops picked them up because they were reasonably cheap and when i say reasonably i mean you're still spending you know five six seven hundred bucks up to twelve hundred around there for machine and that's what the console cost new Okay, so you kind of step back and you think, am I going to buy a used machine or am I going to buy this brand new machine? So, before we get started, let's just look at the Conso 1206. Alright, so one thing I want to talk about, you know, when you first look at it is the table. Um, depending where you buy it from, a lot of the manufacturers or distributors, I guess, they will offer a table with it. And this is important because you're going to need a table. Um, you, you just have to have it. It's part of it. I don't really care so much about the measuring pieces. I never use them. Um, but the table itself is kind of where everything locks into because the machine does tilt up. Um, and the big thing with the 1206 is that it's actually self-oiling. So you have to have a table, you know, with the ability to drop the oil pan down inside of there, as you can see. Um, I would almost call it partially self you know partially self-oiling is what I almost want to say. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, this is... A self oiling machine. A lot of the machines out there aren't. Um, in my opinion, I would prefer that there's a little more oil running through everything. So I know there's less wear, less tear. Um, you do need to replace your oils every once in a while, especially like where I'm at in Ohio, it's very humid. So you, I drain it out and I replace it every once in a while, which there is a drain plug down. You can see it here where everything goes that direction. Um, my, oils, my oil is even a little bit low right now. Um, that'll get changed here soon as we get into springtime. So, as everything moves, we, you know, there is an oil pickup here, and it's going to send oil throughout, you know, various components. On this end is where your bobbin is. To remove your bobbin, you just need to lift this little lever, and your bobbin casing, or whatever you would like to call it, bobbin holder will slide right out. Um, and other than that, this all stays down. Um, one thing is when it's down, you can actually lift this up. I can't get my fat fingers in there. But you can actually lift this up. And then you can access your bobbin. Now, I usually lift the machine up and just replace the bobbin. Or you can reach underneath, see my hand under here, and replace the bobbin, which is what I do uh, probably 90% of the time. I just reach under there, and you kind of get used to where it's at, and you can feel it, and you can pop it out. It, it does have a little hand crank over here. And one difference, and this is the big difference in the new machine, okay, is that it actually has an electric servo, if you can see under there. The older machines are clutch driven, and the electric servo is kind of a newer development as we as we advance in uh, electric, you know, in, in the power of an electric machine. So you do have the control here, which is your motor speed or your motor power output, and then your switches up here and a fuse next to it, and then your pedal, because you're running an electric servo, very very easy to push, and then uh, 
you know, you really have a lot of control over it. It's not like the old clutch machines. Sheesh, I was going to come out here and uh, show you guys my Singer 111, and it's kind of become a parts table, hasn't it? This is the Singer 111 155. These were the powerhouse of the military industry for a long time, okay? The, these are very simplified machines, and they are very good machines. We just start having issues with our machine where occasionally it would miss a stitch. And doing higher-end stuff, you really don't want that, okay? We want a, a flawless, picture-perfect, you know, outcome. But, you know, going back to, you know, where you oil on this machine is really where, where you see a hole. A bunch of oil goes in here. Oil goes in here and here and here and, you know, down through some of these holes into the bottom. Uh, it's a lot of oiling, you know, up here on top, which you can see where that hole kind of goes down inside of in there. And then uh, when we tilt this machine up, I'll make sure I don't crush anything back there. You know, you can see this one is not a self-oiling machine and uh, it's just a lot of gears into there. So what I would do is I would lift it up and oil all of this when I was using the machine. You can see where I converted our external electric motor as well. Probably need to get that new motor out of there. It's a fairly new motor. It was only used for a little bit before we switched machines. And this is the big old clutch servo that came off our 111. And this is, uh, you know, this is like I said, this these things aren't light at all. I mean, it's, it's heavy. Um, and the way this works, well, I guess you can't really see in there at all, can you? It's kind of a closed unit. But the way it works is there's a big, you know, a big motor that starts to turn in there as soon as you click it on. And then as you push the pedal down, start to flip it back over. As you push the pedal down, it pulls on this, and it literally pushes a clutch against a wheel. And then it, it begins to turn your, your, uh, your belt that would be attached to this pulley. Not a whole lot to it. I mean, it's it's pretty old school, bulky, and uses a ton of power even if you're not stitching with it at the time. So that's why I'm getting away from these because the electric servos are far smaller, and then you can have it clicked on. But if you're not stitching with it, if you don't have your foot on the pedal, you're not using any power. This, as soon as you click it on, it's, it's moving and it's going, and it's not going to stop. That little bitty servo underneath there, that little bitty motor, is what replaces this big hunk of thing. So, easier to move the whole machine around, easier to operate, smoother to operate, and uh, just makes your, whole, your life a whole lot easier. And that's one of the things I really want to focus on and talk about, okay? It's not like the old clutch machines where you have this motor in there just spinning, they were kind of loud, and then as you push the pedal, you know, you're, you're pushing that clutch against the plate until it grabs. So, if you were stitching slowly, ultimately, you were slipping a clutch. Um, so, you are going to have some sort of friction material that's going to wear out over time. And this isn't that, okay? With it being an electric servo, this, the, the pedal acts as a potentiometer. So, and a potentiometer is just pretty much you have between 0 and 100% power, and the pedal just fluctuates somewhere between there. And that's your power output. So there's very little wear that happens on anything. Now, I will say that when you get near lower uh, settings on there, that, you know, you're not, you don't have as much power max being pushed in your machine, so you could find that, you know, you're not going to make it all the way through materials. Lick it up a couple clicks. That's what I do. I have my machine set very low when I'm doing like vinyls or when I'm doing softer materials. And it's just so my whole machine operates slower. And then if I'm running like a leather, a thick leather, I can click my machine up. I've never had to turn my machine all the way up. And I've done a few layers thick of leather just to see if it would do it. So that, that doesn't kind of say how powerful an electric motor is. I, I don't know what that, what else to tell you. Um, one thing I will add is that it originally came with a light. I got rid of the light because I, well, now I'm in our race trailer to do mobile operation. But before that, I had a, a, had a big shop light from uh, Menards hanging right above my machine that was about the same length. Guys, I've worked with those old lights for a lot of years. Get rid of them and go buy yourself a big light and just hang it above your machine because you can see everything. And there's no blind spots. There's no moving the light around. Uh, I'll never go back to running another light. And even now, you can see the LED strips that I have running inside of a race trailer all the way around me. So everything's really well lit. So some big things that you need if you're thinking about getting into an upholstery shop. 
um, as far as a machine goes. Obviously, you need good scissors and good measuring equipment and things like that. But the big thing with uh, a machine is that it needs to be a walking foot machine. Now, there's a few different kinds of machines out there, but the basic machine that every shop has to have is a straight stitch walking foot machine. Straight stitch means that the, it's just a straight, you know, there's no zigzags, there's no little special effects. You need to be able to do a completely straight line. And a walking foot means that the top and the bottom both move together, okay? So they're actually reaching out and they're grabbing the material and they're pulling it as one as the needle runs through it. And this is important. Normal machines, the top foot actually doesn't move, okay? It's not walking. So you have your feet underneath, which will come up and grab the material and slide it forward. But there's that idea of how much friction do you want and how much friction can this really grab with this holding and not cause some sort of movement, wrinkles, or differences in stitch length. And that's usually what happens is you end up with a difference in stitch length. So, so looking here, and what we mean by walking foot, and I'll, I'll hand crank this just so you can see it. You can see that as we come forward, the needle goes down. You see how everything right there just shifted backwards. And I'll actually, hold on, my string's going to get tangled. I ain't paying attention. Hold on. Okay, let's get in here and untangle it now. Okay. Rule of thumb, don't crank your machines unless you have tension on your string, or it will tangle. And these industrial machines do not care. I've stitched through a finger, and I've stitched through things you don't want to stitch through. So anyways, so if you watch as I'm hand cranking this, it'll come forward. And then it'll go down, and then everything will come together, and it'll go back. Now, my foot's raised right now. So if I actually put my foot down, you can see that it's going to come forward. It'll come from the angle. Okay, so it's going to lift up. It's going to come forward. When it comes down, it's going to pinch with this one. The outer foot, or the guide foot, is going to lift up a little bit, and it's going to pull everything back as one piece. And then the guide foot will go back down, and everything will lift back up. You know, the top, the center will lift, the center down at the bottom will drop, and it'll come back forward and bite it again. This is important. This is important, and this is the biggest factor, the biggest difference between this and a home machine. Um, things that you're using to sew like a dress, in most cases, don't have what's called a walking foot, or that centerpiece that's able to walk forward and backwards, and it really is what makes everything expensive. <laughs> so, now that I got the machine down, let's talk about why I said partially self-oiling and not completely self-oiling. So as you've seen, we have an oil pickup and that's gonna pump oil into different areas that you physically can't see inside the machine. These areas generally are uh, attached with some sort of a rope or some sort of a plate covering that where you know oil is gonna seep out over time and just slowly oil those bearings or oil those bushings or you know anywhere there's a contact. But you do need to get some sort of a machine oil just like you did for all the your other machines some sort of a little bottle of machine oil. And the nice part on here is they do have it labeled color-coded. They have these little red, well, mine's getting a little worn out, but you can see the little redness around the dots. So you're gonna go through and just gonna add a few drops of oil in here. I fill those those little holes up because over time as that, as everything moves, you know, as, as you're sewing and everything's shifting back and forth and they got this little movement in there right there. You know, I want more oil to get down inside there if I can get it. But, you know, there's dots here. There's dots down in here further. Um, you just need to look at the manual for whatever machine you buy and see where you need to oil it. If you, for for machines that aren't self-oiling, and I've, you know, used them before, you know, there'll be dots back here and all across the top because you do need to oil the contact points. And if the machine's not doing it for you, you're doing it yourself. So every machine is a little different on how you're going to feed everything, okay? You're always going to have some sort of a, you know, a bobbin casing. Um, this is the release to take the bobbin out, like we talked about earlier. And then somewhere around there, there's going to be an adjustment and some little flap or something to add tension from the bobbin itself. Uh, it, on cheap machines, I can tell you right now that there's no adjustment. So don't cheap out because you... To be able to adjust the bobbin is to make that bottom tension tighter and ultimately when you're adjusting tension you know you, you're adjusting where the loop is and trying to get it in the center of the material and if you can't adjust down then that means the only thing you can do is loosen the top and hope that you know you don't get too loose bobbins you know on your industrial machines they're generally going to be metal and you can buy plastic replacements well what i found is that all the plastic replacements come in a very very small 
thread size for what I'm trying to use it for. Like I said, I do high-end uh, automotive and marine upholstery. So I, gen I tend to go with a larger thread, and I don't like the plastic bobbin idea. It's just my opinion, okay? I'll take an extra five or ten minutes to sit here and wind some bobbins quick before I start my project because I'm controlling the thread type. It's not a cotton thread underneath. I know exactly what the thread is. I know that it's a you know a synthetic woven thread. I don't have to question what I'm putting underneath my machine. It's just my opinion. And I'm using the exact same machine for the bottom and the top stitch. So if my bottom stitch ever shows or you know I'm doing something where I need that bottom stitch to show because it's going to be you know, a detail stitch for like French seams or anything like that, I, I'm using the exact same thread so I don't have to change a bunch of stuff out because again, we adjust that tension. So if you get a smaller thread, your tension on that thread is, is going to be less, okay? Because it is smaller, you know, there's less pulling through there. If you go from a smaller thread to a bigger thread, you're going to have too much tension on this. So instead of going through and readjusting everything, if I need to have a, a shown seam, I just use the exact same thread underneath as I do on top. So that way I can buy large spools and I can just spool out a couple before each project. Like I said, maybe five or ten minutes. And it, honestly, if you forget, it takes no time to pull the thread out, move your project off to the side, reach over here and, and, and do a bobbin or two. To fill bobbins, you're going to take it and you're going to set it on here. Just push it over. And you're going to take your string, which is you know the, your normal string, like I said, that's routed through here. And you're going to take it and reroute it going through here you're just gonna go through a hole around the edge again here's an, a place to adjust tension so you want to get it tight enough to where it's just barely spinning the bobbin but everything's staying tight and then you're going to take this you're going to push it down now when you do that what's going to happen if you see here normal normal machine operation there's no tension being put on that belt so when you push this forward it's going to put tension on that belt so now if i spin this it's going to spin the bobbin itself on this machine it still operates the foot What's that mean? Don't have your string through the foot or you're going to cause tangles. I already got tangles going on over here because I wasn't I wasn't careful with my string. So what I usually do, and this is just my opinion, is I'll clip this quick. I'll reach over here and I'll clip this end. Now I run my string through here and back over there. And then uh, I'll take the, the little end out of the needle itself. Now see how it's not in the way? It's up here out of the way. So then, when you spin this, everything's going to spin fine. I'll even lift the foot, just so there's no tension and there's no extra wear happening. So now, you know, you, you hit the pedal, which my machine's not plugged in right now, but you hit the pedal and it'll fill your bobbin. Then, when you want to go back through and, you know, re-thread your machine, if you're kind of new to the machine, you know, this gives you a guide. I've used, like I said, I've used the same machine for probably five years now, so I memorized the pattern quick just to, you know, loop through, loop around, loop these two, go around, back down, and this here is your tensioner again, and then you go underneath the loop, through the slots, and then this here is your, is what adds tension to each stitch, okay? And then, you know, run down this side, around that loop, through the hole, and onto the needle. But until you get used to that, until you get in the habit, if, when you cut this, now you just have a guide. And you don't really need to remove the string when you go to put your new string through, you know? Say I was going to switch to white, and I'm not familiar with this machine, I can now grab the white and then just follow the holes, you know? There's room. And then when everything's done, what I like to do is I grab right here in the middle, and that way I can pull up this side. Then you pull it this way and pull it this side. You're not causing any wear. You're not jerking on things. But you just hit pulled the, the thread out of there real simply. With the same thing with bobbins, if you're going to use white, you might want to use a white bobbin. Because uh, every once in a while, those stitches in the seam show. So you kind of need to be cautious about that. Now, I'm about to tear these seats apart. This isn't my work. But here's a great example. You know, over time and where that's pulling at... You can see the, the stitches down in there. What you don't want is a color that doesn't belong. You know, I don't want to use black on a white material, and I wouldn't want to use red thread on anything that ain't red. So what can you use these machines for? Again, this is a straight stitch. Okay, this is a straight line. We use it nonstop on things like vinyls. If you can see this vinyl over here, this is just a black vinyl. There's actually three different kinds of black vinyl right there. We're testing for some gym material. Uh, that way we can make sure it's safe to be cleaned with bleach and other heavy cleaners. We sew leather on these machines all the time. And again, 
we can sew some thick leather on these machines. You know, don't be discouraged. If you want to sew some thick material, these will do it. Now, the Singer 111 155s, a lot of people convert those to leather sewing machines, like leather exclusive sewing machines. And that's so they can run a really thick thread in there that's going to look good on their leather projects. You can do the same thing with this. But there's a lot of things you have to get switched out if you're going to convert a machine like this to leather. Okay, you're, gonna, you're obviously going to need bigger needles, but you kind of have to be careful with your tension to make sure you're not going to max anything out, loosening it up. Um, you need to be careful with your feet and how much clearance there is when the needle goes down through to make sure you know it's not going to get snagged up in there, the thread, so that way it doesn't actually tear or split the thread. And then you got to keep this bobbin in mind, okay? You know, you can run the same bobbins, you just need to make sure you have that adjustment. You can see the adjustment screws right there on the end of mine, and they adjust the tension on that flap. But, you know, generally you can convert one of the machines very easy. You know, along with the top foot, you know, when we looked at the walking foot, you know, you need to keep that top hole in mind, but also the bottom one as well. But, you know, this is all just things that if you're going to convert a machine to a leather, uh, generally like the Singer 155s, they make all the parts for that on the market, okay? You're not making anything. Um, same thing with the old Conso 206s. A lot of people convert those to a leather machine. And the 1206 is the same machine, just with these upgrades, okay? So any foot you could buy for a 206, you can use on this 1206. And that's one thing we need to talk about, okay? When you're buying feet or specialty feet, like binding feet or piping feet, things like that, the 155 and the 206s, the Singer and the Consos, uh, generally all the parts work together. The feet, okay, the attachments for the bottoms. Um, and this runs right off that 206. The 1206 is literally an electric self-oiling 206. So don't be fooled by it, okay? It's just the future of the machine by being electric and by having all these little, you know, tricks, tips, and amenities that come with it. Because the 206 is getting old. Let's just be honest, guys. They're still making it, but the 206 is getting old. And honestly, I hate clutch motors. Even our Singer 111 back there, even though it's probably, what, 60, 70, 80 years old, uh, I converted that to an electric motor six years ago. Just to see, I bought like a cheap electric motor off Amazon just to see how it would, it would run, and I liked it, okay? It was an upgrade in my opinion because you don't have, when you click the machine on, there's zero noise with the electric machine. It's not doing anything. You know, with the, with the clutch machine motors, you have that constant sound of the motor running. Electric machines don't have that. When you turn it on, it's dead silent. That makes it nice inside of a shop, guys. There's no noise, and you're not using power if you're not using power, okay? So when we run it in our race trailer like this, our race trailer runs off a 110 plug. I can plug it into anything, a garage. You know, we're partnered with a lot of shops. I'll show up at the shop with this if I got a big project going on, it's gonna take me a week or two. Uh, we'll show up with our race trailer. You know, we'll show up at the shop like this, give us one plug and we have the big extension cord that'll run to the race trailer. We plug in and this is a fully operational shop. I mean, it's messy right now because I just pulled it home from a shop and I haven't cleaned out the back yet. But I'm talking sewing machines. There's work tables back there, even though they're covered. All of my material stored in the back. That's all door cards and things like that. And then over here, I mean, the, these are seats we're about to tear apart. You know, this is new covers for it. You know, again, there's door card material. There's HDPE back here. Every tool you could think of. More built-in toolboxes. This is just more projects right now. The foam for those seats. I mean. We have a lot of space, and there's even still the whole area up there which I convert to an office when we pull into a spot. Which means that all my sample books and everything can go with me, and they can all stay organized, and then I, uh, you know, can work on the road. We were originally running a location that, you know, we had customers come to and things like that, and, you know, just the overhead and everything we had going on, it meant that we had to work a lot of hours every single month without making a single penny before we made a profit. This we have almost no overhead on. We already own it. We already had the race trailer. So even if we weren't already going to have the trailer, I mean, you're talking about buying one of these for 15 grand max, 20 maybe brand new, you know, an enclosed trailer with a fifth wheel that you can hook to your truck. That's what, a year in some places for a building, two years back, and you could use this for a long time. You show up at marinas and, you know, you tell customers I'm coming out between this day and this day show up and do boats all day long like what we do we have you know these shops that we have as customers and we're like when are you working on this car they're going to tear it down for paint and rewiring and all of this stuff we show up and do the interior whenever it needs to get done that's amazing and this machine sits right here this right now is strapped to the floor you know there's not a whole lot of movement in there there's a little bit because of the rubber feet but ultimately that's strapped to the floor 
and it doesn't move and it doesn't need to move. Some fold out tables behind you that I can fold out that come either here next to me if I have a project that's big to go through or it can go on the other side of the table. Then you have your whole work area down here. We even had saws in here that I just pulled out and if I will show up and need to cut door card or if I need to cut boards or anything like that, open the back of the trailer and cut back there and all your sawdust can get collected into the shop back or go out the back. It's a nice setup, but I do digress, okay? We're talking about a machine. So a few other things that you can adjust here and I just want to talk about quick is your stitch length. Um, that's preference on the project. Obviously, you know, you need to adjust this according to your project. I mean, there's not, not a whole lot more I can say about that. Right now I have it set at about four and a half and that's just where the stitches look good when we are doing vinyls. If you're doing a thinner material, you might want to cut that back a little bit so you don't have gaps. Um, and if you're doing a thicker material, you can even ramp it up even more. Like a leather, you'd want a very large stick, stitch length. Or you could do, you know, on your seams, you can have like around a four and a half. And then if you have like a French seam or a detail stitch that you're going to put somewhere, up that stitch length and make it look a little longer, a little nicer. You know, it's they're not huge adjustments, but it is an adjustment. Um, again, you can hand crank this. The pedal's at the bottom. One thing I do like is if you look under here, this lever right here that your knee lines up to when you're sewing. Let's see my knee. Uh, that actually operates the foot. So if I put the foot down and I push the lever over it, it lifts the foot. This is nice for doing corners or, you know, really anything. Like when we do patches for for leather work, uh, you know, you just have something you can lift up and just adjust that material, drop it back down, lift it up, adjust the material, drop it back down. Uh, so I do like the knee pedal. I think that that's kind of a needed thing. One thing that you really need to look for if you're thinking about buying an industrial machine is if it has reverse. Yeah, you would think all machines have reverse and they don't. A lot of the old ones don't. This is our reverse switch. You push it down. I have other machines where they have a button that you'll push in or, uh, you know, there's just some different ways they do it. Make sure the machine has reverse. If it doesn't, it's not a big deal. But when you start a stitch, especially you know something like a seam, like seen over here on the corners, uh, you want to go forward and then you want to go back a couple stitches and go one stitch past your first one, and then you'll start stitching. It kind of gives this like back and forth effect, and that's called a lock stitch. You want to be able to make sure you can do those. If you don't have that, you can technically do a lock stitch. What you'll do is you'll do two or three stitches. You'll actually lift the foot up. You'll slide the material back, and you'll put the whole... And you'll put the needle back in the first hole and then you'll start stitching, which does create a lock. But you kind of have this, you know, stitch or two with a gap. The, the string might not tuck back down into. So this is just an easy way uh, to push it, go backwards, come back forward. Some machines, the back stitching isn't the same length as the front stitching. So you might have like a little, I don't know how to explain it. It looks a little balled up when that happens. This machine, when you press it down, the stitch backwards, the exact same as a stitch forward. So you'll go back into the same holes as long as you're straight. One thing to keep in mind is the, uh, the the guide foot on the outside. You can buy this in different sizes, different shapes. Um, I like to figure out the distance from this guide foot to my needle center, and then that's what I mark on materials. I generally don't try to you know stay consistent marking a half inch and sew down that half inch line. What I do is I mark from the center to the edge, and then I transfer that to my material. So it just so happens that the center of this needle to the left side of my foot is the same width as the stock bobbins that come with this. But I usually don't sew on the left side of my foot. I usually sew on the right side of my foot because that gives me all this space over here for the project to sit. So you need to figure that, that distance out. There are some old bobbins that I have from some of my old machines um, that are inside right now that are actually the distance from the center of my needle to the right side of my foot. The bobbin trick's easy, okay, because when you draw out your, your template line and then you have to add your seam allowance on there, you just set this there and you mark it and you go and you go and you go and you go and you can go around curves and things like that. The other thing you can do is grab a measuring tool. I've used see-through rulers and quick went around and marked them. I've used uh, compasses and just went around and, and etched it. There's a lot of different ways you can mark a seam allowance or the amount you're adding to the outside of the of, uh pattern to make sure you can actually sew the seam that gets hidden on the inside. I'll just show you, show you quick. So this is a seam. This is stone. So this is so this is a stitched black canvas that we were doing for a headliner trial or a different kind of headliner um, and this is a sewn seam. Okay so the seam allowance is this distance right here. 
This right here is a measured seam allowance at a half inch that goes through our machine on that green marked line you've seen. But you can adjust this. Now what I usually do is I make the seam allowance the same distance as the edge of my foot to the center of my needle. And that makes it so I can just run this right down the edge of the foot. It's very easy to align. It's very easy to adjust. And then you can just run it. So I think that's everything I really have to say about the, the Conso P1206RB1. Or, you know, the easiest way to say it is the Conso 1206. Again, this is a 206 with an electric motor. So don't get overwhelmed if your shop's currently using a 206 or a Singer 111 and you're thinking about upgrading to this. This is a great machine. I think this is a machine that really is going to be, you know, the powerhouse for the future of, of upholstery shops. I know that some companies out there like Sailrite are coming out with some newer machines. I haven't tested them. You know, this really has remained the powerhouse for our shop. You know, when we switched to the 1206, I loved it so much that I stopped using my other machines. Obviously, if you're going to do something with like a zigzag stitch or some kind of adjustments, you're, you're going to need something different. This is a straight stitch machine with a table. Um, and, and again, it's self-oiling. So think about it, okay? This is for straight stitch. You can still do curves. You can still do circles. You can still do, you know, different patterns like that. It's just the needle itself isn't going to move. It's going to sew in a straight line every single time. So, uh, yeah, the Concept 1206, I think it's a great machine. I think every upholstery shop needs one or should consider buying one. And, uh, you know, obviously get out there, sew some stuff, have fun, and make cool things. And do us a favor. If you're going to make something cool, if you're going to sew something one-off custom, be sure to tag us in it. I want to see your guys' projects. That's serious. When I say I want to see your projects, I mean it. I look at cool stuff all day on the internet I... It blows my mind. It makes you think. It makes you come up with new things. Show me what you guys are doing. I want to see it. So go out there. Make cool things. Have fun. And uh, remember, have a good day.